What up space fam, Golzen here from Anime Uproar back at it again to discuss another Demon Slayer video. And this one is very special because I'm going to be going in depth into the man who crushed Muzan, utterly defeated him in a second, and sent the Demon King crying to his mommy. So make sure to stay tuned for this one because this is my favorite character in the entire series. And we will be going into everything there is to know about this dude, including his fight with Muzan, connection to Tanjiro, his fight against Upper Moon One, and much more. So stay tuned for that. If you do enjoy seeing these Demon Slayer videos and want to keep them coming, you know what to do. Channel the Demon Slayer within and smash that like button with no mercy. Remember, smashing that like button is the strongest Demon Slayer energy and passing is scared Muzan energy, so choose wisely. If you haven't, make this the video you subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications or you will miss future Demon Slayer videos and updates. And while you wait for the next video to drop, feel free to check out my growing Demon Slayer playlist that includes videos on all the Hashira, Demon Moons, and much more. Link to that is in the description. Now, without further ado, let's jump into it, spoilers and all. The character we are breaking down today is Yorichi Tsugikuni, the first breath style user, the user of the strongest breath style, sun breathing, and the strongest demon slayer in history. You'll recognize this dude as the really cool looking samurai that demons keep seeing or remembering when they look at Tanjiro at certain points in the story. He has a similar mark on his forehead to Tanjiro, especially when Tanjiro's mark evolves, and he wears the exact same earrings Tanjiro wears. All demons are scared of this man because they were created using Muzan's blood and Muzan still has PTSD from their fight. A recent example of this character's appearance was when Daki suddenly saw a glimpse of him when Tanjiro was lecturing her about the importance of life, and she realized that was a memory from Muzan's blood, not her own. But let's start from the beginning when Yorichu was born before his older brother was jealous of him for being someone who, according to him, received the god's favor and burned everything like the sun, and before Muzan was so very scared of him. Yorichi was born as the younger twin of Michikatsu Tsugikuni. We know that Yorichi was born centuries ago, more precisely over 480 years before the current events of the anime. We are told that when the two were born, twins were viewed as inauspicious, aka a bad sign, because they often caused succession disputes. Yorichi was born with his mark on his forehead. Rather than being viewed as a good thing, it was viewed as disturbing and his father declared that he would kill baby Yorichi. Upon hearing this, Yorichi's mom got very angry and didn't calm down until the father agreed that he wouldn't kill Yorichi. Instead, when he reached 10 years old, he'd be sent to a temple. Ironically, the jealous Michikatsu was treated much better as a child. He got a better room, better clothes, better education, better food, and so on. Their upbringing was completely different. From Michikatsu's perspective, it looked like Yorichi was spoiled by their mother and couldn't leave her side. But we'll figure out later that this was because she wasn't well and Yorichi was actually supporting her, even as a child. Kid Michikatsu had no idea though and pitied Yorichi for being such a child and such a baby, and that's probably why he took what eventually happened so much worse. This whole time, he clearly thought he was superior to little bro. Yorichi, with the weird mark on his face. In his defense though, Michikatsu was pretty nice when he thought that his little brother was inferior to him. Against his father's will, he would play in Yorichi's small room with him, and even though he couldn't gift Yorichi his own belongings because his father would notice, he did make a flute for Yorichi and give it as a gift to him. Since he was a baby and as a kid, Yorichi never smiled. He didn't even speak until he was seven, so everyone thought he was deaf. It's funny though, one day he was watching his brother practice swordsmanship, and he spoke completely coherently, saying, and I quote, My brother is your dream to become the strongest samurai in the nation, end quote. Even though it was the first time Michikatsu heard him speak, he couldn't help but notice that Yorichi spoke so smoothly. Michikatsu gasped and dropped his sword. Yorichi went on to say that he also wanted to be a samurai, but as mentioned, his parents were gonna send him to a temple when he reached 10 years old, wanting him to be a priest rather than a samurai. It was at at this point, after speaking for the first time about wanting to be a samurai like his brother, that 7 year old Yorichi smiled which disturbed Michikatsu who'd never seen him smile before. Michikatsu thought Yorichi had no shot, since he was a boy who clung to his mother's side all the time while samurai need to be ready to risk their lives. However, something drove Yorichi to keep trying. He stuck around during Michikatsu's swordsmanship training, saying he wanted to learn too. Finally, their father's vassal, who was teaching Michikatsu the way of the sword, gave Yorichi 
Yorichi a practice sword for fun. He casually told Yorichi how to hold the sword and how to stand. He told Yorichi to try to strike him and, as we can imagine, he probably thought he was just humoring the little Yorichi who never even held a sword before. But this is where Yorichi started to break Michikatsu's world apart. Yorichi was insanely talented from the beginning. No matter how much Michikatsu tried, he wasn't able to land a single blow on the trainer. But the inexperienced Yorichi, in the blink of an eye, landed four strikes on the trainer and rendered him unconscious. So at seven years old, he was able able to crush a hand-picked adult sword expert. He struck the man on the neck, chest, stomach, and leg. No bones were broken, but he had fist-sized lumps all over his body. You might think such unbelievable natural talent would encourage Yorichi, but quite the opposite happened. After embarrassing the teacher, he stopped saying he wanted to become a samurai. The feeling of hitting someone was unbearable to him. Michikatsu couldn't leave it alone though. He needed to know Yorichi's secret to being so strong, and he kept questioning his little brother about it. Yorichi finally said, and I quote, Before your opponent attacks, his lungs heave. You just look closely at the disposition of his bones, the contraction of his muscles, and the flow of his blood, end quote. As Michikatsu explained, Yorichi could see inside the bodies of living creatures. It took him a while to understand that just as he was born with the Demon Slayer mark, he was also born with special sight. As we find out, this site is access to the transparent world, something that only the most skilled demon slayers like Tanjiro, Gyomei, and so on gain access to after a bunch of training and experience, and Yorichi was born with it. Yorichi possessed physical abilities that complemented the site too. Here is where the flip happened. Michikatsu realized that even though he had always pitied Yorichi, his little brother was actually far superior to him. Michikatsu was obsessed with mastering the way of the sword, but Yorichi was more interested in playing board games or flying a kite with his brother. Michikatsu explains that the way of the sword required pain and suffering, but talent had been recognized in him, and the harder he worked, the stronger he got. But compared to a rare child prodigy like Yorichi, he was like a turtle. That's how slow his progress seemed. While Michikatsu's goal was to become the number one swordsman slash samurai, Yorichi, who actually had the talent of a number one, looked bored when his brother talked about swordsmanship. To Yorichi, the way of the sword was less than child's play, even at seven years old. Eventually, it looked like the positions of the brothers was being reversed. The father must have found out about Yorichi's skill, and Michikatsu was really scared that Yorichi would inherit the house and Michikatsu would be forced into the small room and then into the temple, where his dream of becoming a samurai could never come true. However, just as Michikatsu was worrying about this, Yorichi came by to let him know that their mother died and he was heading off to the temple early. He came to say goodbye. Not only did he not get in Michikatsu's way, he even showed him he was still carrying the flute that his older brother had gifted to him. Yorichi said he thinks of the flute as Michikatsu, so even if they are apart, it would be like he's carrying Michikatsu with him. Yorichi says he will not lose heart and will work diligently every day. Even though, to use Michikatsu's words, the flute was junk that could only play off pitch, Yorichi wrapped it in cloth and kept it close to him like it was a treasure. He smiled looking at it, just the thought of the gift continued to warm his heart. Yorichi bowed deeply to his brother and then walked off with hardly anything waving goodbye. Michikatsu then found out from his mother's journal that Yorichi had sensed that their father would make him heir rather than Michikatsu, so he decided to leave earlier than planned. Michikatsu also found out that Yorichi had known of their mother's illness and approaching death, unlike the sheltered Michikatsu. For years, their mother had suffered difficulties on the left side of her body, and then Michikatsu realizes that not only was Yorichi not clinging to his mother out of being spoiled, but was in fact supporting her the entire time. Michikatsu was in fact the spoiled and sheltered one all along. Instead of feeling mad respect for Yorichi at this point as I do, Michikatsu is overwhelmed by feelings of jealousy. He tells us from the bottom of his heart, he hated Yorichi for being being a genius. Although I don't think Michikatsu actually wanted this at his core, or at least not every part of him, he was overwhelmed by a sense of inferiority and because of that he does say that he begged for Yorichi to die. He wished his little brother had never been born since his existence defied the laws of nature. Their father tried to bring back Yorichi, but he wasn't at the temple. He had disappeared without a trace. So although Michikatsu didn't know what happened if kidnappers got him, a landslide, or a bear, he did receive his wish in a way. Yorichi was gone and his sense of inferiority and burning jealousy abated. 
He had a peaceful time for 10 years until Yorichi reappeared one day, but before we cover that, let's look at what Yorichi was doing during Michikatsu's 10 years of peace. We discover this from Tanjiro's ancestral memories that he inherits from Sumiyoshi, who is the spitting image of Tanjiro. Yorichi shows up before Tanjiro's ancestor in adult form. Yorichi tells Sumiyoshi that he's pleased they look happy. When Yorichi sees people who are happy, it makes him happy. He goes on to say that the world holds much that is beautiful. It is a blessing simply to be born into it. He gives us some added information about his childhood, like that his mother was a woman of deep faith. Each day she prayed that strife would disappear from this world, and she asked the sun deity to shine warmly upon Yorichi's deaf ears. This is big because Tanjiro's Dance of the Fire God seems to be celebrating this same sun deity, and as we know, the dance is linked to sun breathing, which is the first and strongest style that Yorichi created. Thus, it seems very fitting that Yorichi is being associated with the sun deity here. It's revealed that his mother is the one who made the iconic earrings that Tanjiro wears to this day, as a charm for Yorichi and another nod to her respect for the sun deity. Yorichi explains that he regrets the fact that his mother worried because he never spoke and he also mentions that Michikatsu was a kind boy who was always concerned about Yorichi. The day after their father hit Michikatsu and ordered him not to pamper Yorichi, that that's the day he made and gave him that flute. This is partly why I don't believe Michikatsu actually hated Yorichi with all his heart. More accurately, he hated himself and was super hard on himself. So much so that he even left out parts of his own backstory that would make him seem like a better guy, because he has such a low view of himself. Michikatsu even told Yorichi that when he needed help, he could just blow the flute and Michikatsu would come right away. The older brother told him not to worry and smiled, despite his bruised and swollen face. It's at this point that Yorichi revealed he was supposed to go to the temple, but he didn't. Instead, he wanted to run as hard as he could under the infinite expanse of the beautiful sky, and yet, after a whole day and night, he did not stop from exhaustion. This is another nod to Yorichi's extraordinary natural talent. Running a marathon at a slower pace is hard, let alone running as hard as you can for a whole day and night without even being exhausted. He eventually saw a girl that was around his age in the mountains. He finds out that her family died in a plague. She's all alone and very lonely, so she came here to find tadpoles to take home, but she ends up freeing the tadpoles from the bucket because she feels sorry about separating them from their families. Kid Yorichi offers to accompany her home and notices that her eyes are like obsidian. The girl's name was Uta, and they decide to live together. It's a very cute relationship, whereas Yorichi was stoic and a boy a few words, Uta talked from morning to evening. From her, Yorichi learned that people see the world in different ways. For instance, she never even heard of seeing through living bodies as if they were transparent. How weird is that? Yorichi felt like he was estranged from other people because he was like a kite whose string had broken, but Uta held on to his hand firmly. Ten years later they married, so that should be the same year Yorichi meets Michikatsu again. Uta was pregnant and it was nearly time for her to give birth. Yorichi went to get a midwife and he planned to return before sunset. However, Yorichi being the nice guy he is gets sidetracked. He helps an old man with a bad heart who was rushing to visit his son who had been fatally wounded in battle. He delivers the old man to his son and decides he'll get the midwife tomorrow. He rushes home but night has fallen. When he arrives, he sees that someone has killed Uta and their child in her womb. Back to his conversation with Sumiyoshi, Yorichi explains that another person may not hesitate to trample upon someone whose life you value more than your own. After he found his wife like that, Yorichi was in a daze and cradled the bodies for 10 days until a swordsman came in pursuit of a demon. You can tell he's an ancestor of Rengoku's. The swordsman encouraged Yorichi to mourn them properly through prayer. Yorichi explains that he just wanted to live a quiet life with his family in a small house where they would sleep side by side. He would be close enough to see the faces of his beloved wife and child, and close enough to reach out and take their hands. That would have been enough for him. He didn't need to be the best, to be rich, or to be famous. But even that simple dream did not come true because demons exist in the world. So after the funeral, this is when Yorichi becomes a demon slayer. There were always demon hunters, but none of them used breathing, so Yorichi taught them how to do it. The swordsmen called the Hashira were already strong and when they used breathing along with the original sword forms of flame, wind, 
water, thunder, and stone, they improved even further. The demon slayers learned to defeat demons one after the next. And Yorichi mentions that after demons killed his elder brother's subordinate, he too became a demon slayer and lent his strength to the demon slayer core. So let's quickly jump back to Michikatsu's backstory since we just caught up with where we left off there. As Michikatsu was explaining, he was living in peace for 10 years. He married and had children in that time. Every day was tranquil and somewhat boring. Interesting that he used somewhat boring there, since I don't think Yorichi would have, but still, tranquil is good, and he might have meant it in a good way. The flow of time felt extremely slow for him. But then everything changed when a demon attacked. The demon attacked where he and his men had camped. The time that stagnated up to that point in his view had begun to move again. Then who should appear but little demon slaying bro Yorichi to save Michikatsu from the demon. Even though Yorichi was talented before, Michikatsu noticed that he was completely different now. He had mastered the sword. The moment Michikatsu saw Yorichi and how he could easily defeat inhuman opponents, his serenity was destroyed. His stomach again began to burn with jealousy and hate. Despite having saved Michikatsu, Yorichi still apologized apologized for not arriving in time to save his subordinates too. Michikatsu observed that Yorichi wasn't just strong, he was also a person of faultless character. Michikatsu decided that he'd make Yorichi's strength and sword skills his own, no matter what the cost. He abandoned everything. He abandoned his home, wife, and children and chose the path of a demon slayer same as Yorichi. Although Yorichi taught people sword and breathing techniques, not a single person could match him. To suit each person's skills and capabilities, Yorichi changed the breathing technique as he taught. Thus, techniques derived from sun breathing, the first breath, came one after the other. The number of marked ones also increased, and the power of the Demon Slayer core rose. This is an important detail because yes, Yorichi is scary powerful on his own, but beyond that, he improved the power of every other Demon Slayer and the Demon Slayer core as a whole by teaching them breathing and by increasing the number of marked ones, who only appear after an initial marked one has, like Yorichi. Before long, even Michikatsu manifested a mark identical to Yorichi's, but but in the end, even Yorichi's own twin paled in comparison to him, and Michikatsu couldn't learn sun breathing, but only a derivative later named moon breathing. Michikatsu thought he could catch up to Yorichi if he continued to train, so he languished in frustration until the marked ones began dying one after the other. As Michikatsu explained, the mark gave people power in exchange for their lifespan, so this golden era of demon slayers would soon end. Michikatsu thought he had no future left. He had no time left for more training, so when Muzan told him he could carry on by becoming becoming a demon, he was intrigued. Muzan told him if he became a demon, he could live on forever and focus on mastering breathing techniques. At the same time, Muzan would get what he wants to make a demon out of a swordsman who uses breathing techniques. From Michikatsu's perspective, the path he had hoped for had opened up. He would be free of all restrictions. Since he previously said he'd catch up to Yorichi at all costs, it doesn't come as a surprise that he agreed to become a demon. If Yorichi was a strong man of faultless character, Michikatsu would become a man of no character, a monster, and do whatever he could to bridge the gap in power. We'll get to his eventual final confrontation with Yorichi in a bit, but first, let's turn back to where we left off in Yorichi's backstory. Soon after Michikatsu became a demon slayer, Yorichi found the demon's progenitor, Demon King Muzan himself. In that moment, Yorichi knew that he'd been born for the purpose of defeating this man. You could tell by his expression that Muzan was arrogant at first and severely underestimated what Yorichi was capable of. And that makes sense, this is before Yorichi traumatized him, so he'd probably never even come close to being overpowered up to this point, but that was about to change real quick. First, Muzan said he was no longer interested in swordsmen who use breathing, suggesting that he'd already turned Michikatsu into a demon at that point, and he had no need of yet another demon-enhanced breath-style user. Muzan possessed fearsome speed and a long reach. As Yorichi dodged, he heard the bamboo slicing and falling a considerable distance behind him. He sensed that even a scratch would kill him. This is probably a reference to Muzan's blood being poison for human beings. For the first time in his life, Yorichi actually felt a chill down his spine. But hilariously enough, he still outwardly maintained the same stoic expression as always. Using his ability to see the transparent world, Yorichi could tell that Muzan had 7 hearts and 5 brains. And in that moment, Yorichi said he completed his sword forms. We see him cut through Muzan, and Muzan's horrified what's happening expression is absolutely priceless. Muzan was further confused that his body wasn't regenerating. 
his head wouldn't reconnect. Yorichi realized that his bright red blade would work even against Muzan. But instead of carrying on with the attack ceaselessly, Yorichi asked Muzan, what is the value of a life to you? Muzan didn't respond, his face just turned dark red, possibly due to anger. Yorichi then looked at Tamayo, the demon that was accompanying Muzan, and she didn't move in to help Muzan. In fact, Yorichi saw hope in her eyes as she witnessed Muzan losing. Yorichi finally decided to finish off Muzan and then he turned to Tamayo, but when he took a step toward Muzan, he heard the sound of teeth grinding. The next moment, Muzan's body burst open with incredible force. Out of 1,800 scattered pieces of Muzan, Yorichi cut a little more than 1,500, which is amazing, but he says the remaining pieces were too small. They would later recombine into a lump the size of a head and allow Muzan to regenerate completely. So, not only was Muzan completely overpowered, he straight up knew that his only hope was running away. He'd become the prey even during the nighttime. Tamayo cried and collapsed, saying Yorichi almost did it, but Muzan had overcome the weakness of beheading. Tamayo said she wished Muzan was dead, thinking it would activate Muzan's curse, but surprisingly, she was fine. She did not die. Yorichi eventually calmed Tamayo down, and she explained that Muzan was the progenitor of the demons, and he would probably never show his face to Yorichi again. Literally the best that the demons have to offer, he doesn't even have the hope of being able to become strong enough to take on Yorichi. He needs to let nature and old age beat him. Tamayo was relieved to be free of Muzan's control due to his weakened state and agreed to help Yorichi in defeating Muzan. It was only then that Yorichi heard from the other demon slayers, including Rengoku's ancestor, that his older brother had become a demon. Instead of realizing that Yorichi was their only shot of beating Muzan, the other slayers turned against him because he failed to defeat Muzan and allowed Tamayo to escape. This is just so ridiculous to me because literally everyone else would have failed to defeat Muzan and done an even worse job than Yorichi. But the whole helping Tamayo thing and his brother becoming a demon was too much for them to handle and they banished him from demon slaying as a result. Some even wanted him to take his own life, which is ridiculous. Imagine wanting the strongest demon slayer and the only one capable of overpowering Muzan taken out of the picture. The master at the time was just six and would not allow Yorichi to take his own life. Yorichi was very sorry to further burden the young child who had just lost his dad. Now back to Yorichi explaining all of this to Sumiyoshi. Yorichi tells him that he was born with special strength for the purpose of defeating Muzan, but he was lacking and in the end he failed. Because of that, many more people will die and it pains him. Then the daughter of Sumiyoshi asks Yorichi for a hug. She likes being lifted up high, so Yorichi lifts her up and she laughs. Yorichi can't help but cry when he sees her smile. He hugs her and continues to cry. Sumiyoshi's wife comes and tries to cheer him up as well. We saw in an earlier flashback with Yorichi and Sumiyoshi that Yorichi watched their child before so the mother could get some sleep. Sumiyoshi also thanked Yorichi for saving their lives before and adds that if it weren't for Yorichi, his child never would have been born. In this light, even if he couldn't save everyone, I'm sure Yorichi is glad he could at least save that smiling child and that's partly why he cries. Although him saving Sumiyoshi will eventually lead to Tanjiro and Muzan's defeat, even if it didn't, him saving Sumiyoshi and his family made a world of difference to their lives which should not be overlooked. And that's just one family, Yorichi must have saved many more since he was the star slayer of the Demon Slayer Corps for a good while. Anyway, Sumiyoshi told him that he'll tell his children and grandchildren about Yorichi. Yorichi said that isn't necessary. Yorichi told him that all those who master their trade arrive at the same place, swordsman or charcoal seller, and that even if the times change or the way to that place changes, they are certain to reach the same place. Yorichi insisted he's not someone special. He couldn't protect anything thing that was important to him and he was unable to accomplish even one thing that he should have in his life. Yorichi viewed himself as a man without value. Obviously Yorichi is being way too hard on himself here but luckily he did go on to pass the earrings and sun breathing aka dance of the fire god down to that family who eventually passed them all the way down to Tanjiro. So even if Yorichi thinks he accomplished nothing the story makes it clear that his actions including saving this family directly led to Muzan's eventual defeat. Not to mention the value of all the people he saved and their descendants getting to live full lives.
But before we talk about Muzan's eventual defeat, let's discuss Yorichi's final meeting with his brother Michikatsu, who at this point goes by his demon name Kokushibo. Kokushibo in part took the demon deal because it would give him time to get stronger and escape an early death caused by the mark. Thus he probably thought Yorichi died young too, since he had a mark as well, but Yorichi actually lived to be an old man as Kokushibo sees. As he's being overpowered by the Hashira and Genya during their fight, Kokushibo thinks, this sensation of my composure crumbling up from my feet is detestable. It brings me back memories from 400 years ago. And of course he's talking about when 400 years ago he confronted old Yorichi on the night of a red moon. He could not believe it when he saw it. The aged and decrepit form of his little brother was there. Over 60 years had passed since they last met. So Yorichi, who had stayed human, must have passed 80 years of age. This means Yorichi was born over 480 years ago from the current events of the main story, and Kokushibo has been on the planet for over 480 years. That's definitely a lot of time to hone your craft. Anyways, back to the fight, Kokushibo asked how he was still alive since every marked one dies before they turn 25. And then Yorichi tells him, and I quote, My sympathy is my brother, end quote. Here Yorichi is actually crying for Kokushibo. Now this seems crazy for Kokushibo. Kokushibo granted he has six gross eyes, but he also has eternal youth and is nowhere near death. So when he sees this old and, as he says, ugly creature that was once his little brother pitying him, it makes him pause and reflect. But interestingly enough, he doesn't get angry at old Yorichi. Since this is a very important part of the story, I'll quote Kokushibo directly. He says, and I quote, Even though 60 years ago he had been such an eyesore, the voice calling me brother was terribly hoarse. My brother had never shown the slightest emotion, so at the sight of him shedding tears, something welled up in me for the first time since birth. End quote. Again, this is another example of Kokushibo being more human and less evil monster than he'd like to admit. He goes on to say he was confused at his own unrest and decided he must kill the part of him from when he was human. Yorichi, this old man of brittle flesh past his prime, represents this human part of him and he decides he needs to take him down. He must cleave anyone who turns a sword upon him, even if it is his little brother. Then Kokushibo says Yorichi's odd sentimentality disappeared the next moment. Old Yorichi got serious. Even though he was old, Kokushibo was very affected by the aura of intimidation Yorichi gave off. It was as if rocks had come to rest on both of his shoulders. Kokushibo saw no opening in the old man's stance. Yurichi even told him, here I come, before he attacked to give Kokushibo the best chance possible. And still, after sacrificing everything to get to this point, Kokushibo is no match. Yurichi cuts him before Kokushibo even draws his sword. Kokushibo is angry, wondering why Yurichi was always the special one. Even though he's marked, he lived long. Furthermore, the technique Yorichi used had speed and power no different from when he was in his prime. Kokushibo's memories and burning jealousy returned because he felt like Yorichi alone was outside the laws of this world. He lived receiving the favor of the gods upon himself. Because of that, Kokushibo hates him, wants to kill him. It's sort of similar to the Cain and Abel story, but Kokushibo was never actually strong enough to take his brother's life. Furthermore, Kokushibo is certain that Yorichi's next blow will chop off his head. He calls Yorichi's sword technique that even pressed Muzan nothing less than godly. Kokushibo feels unrest and defeat, like his insides might burst. In his mind, the battle's over, he already lost, but the next and final blow never comes. Yorichi passes away from old age while standing upright like a true legend. I honestly feel like Yorichi's first attack could have finished Kokushibo if he wanted it to, but Kokushibo thinks he was only saved because Yorichi's lifespan wasn't one breath longer. In all likelihood, Yorichi was hesitant to kill his brother since he cared deeply for him still, and that's why Kokushibo survived. Instead of being glad he survived though, Kokushibo was furious. Because of his long life as a demon, he had to live with that humiliation for hundreds of years. Kokushibo thinks because Yorichi died, an honorable death won't visit him. It's interesting in that it seems like he longs for an honorable death after everything he's done. It's like he wishes that Yorichi did finish him off back then. Kokushibo goes on to say, now that the greatest swordsman in the long history of Demon Slayers has died, he must not lose. He chose to continue winning until, to use his own words, he became ugly like this. Referring to his repulsive six-eyed demon form. As that final battle against the Hasha and Genya continues, he also remembers a specific moment he shared with Yorichi during the period they were both slayers. 
Michikatsu told Yorichi that there are no skilled warriors comparable to them, an important detail suggesting that although Yorichi was far superior, Michikatsu was second best, even before becoming a demon, but it just wasn't enough for him. Michikatsu was telling Yorichi that the perfected techniques will die out, but Yorichi, the strongest demon slayer in history, said the two of them aren't that great. Strong and humble, you gotta love him. Yorichi went on to say that they are merely one fragment of humankind's long, long history. He believed that at that very moment, those who surpass their talents are uttering their first cries they may come to reach the same place. Now, of course, Yorichi was heavily underestimating his own specialness here, but even if it wasn't at that moment, eventually people who could work together to overcome Muzan were born. He was just a few centuries off. Still, it's nice seeing how Yorichi smiled calmly and in a carefree way. It's clear that he was in a much better mood when the two were working on the side of good together. He said to Michikatsu, and I quote, There is no need to worry. We may draw the curtain of life closed without unease at any time. Time. Does that not exhilarate you, brother?" End quote. So in stark contrast to Kokushiba, who desperately wanted to be the strongest and feared death, Yorichi believed that he could go at any time and people would eventually surpass him, and this actually made him feel really good. The great irony is that Yorichi didn't care about being the number one swordsman at all, and yet he was, while Kokushibo was willing to sacrifice everything else to become the number one swordsman, and it just wasn't enough. He could never become number one. Kokushibo went on to say after Yorichi died that not only was no one ever able to beat him, but not a single person was even able to harm him in his entire life. He went on to attack Yorichi's body out of frustration, and then he saw that all this time, Yorichi was carrying the flute that Michikatsu gave him so many years ago, the flute that he associated with his big brother. And even though Kokushibo was saying he hated his brother, he was crying. He cared for his brother much more than he ever wanted to admit. He said Yorichi was like the unequaled sun, and all the human beings around him have no path other than yearning, reaching out their hands and writhing in agony until they become ash. Despite giving up everything, Kokushibo could never reach the same place Yorichi did. And although he said that he hated Yorichi and abandoned his humanity, he kept the flute on him for the last 400 years, as we saw when the Hashira and Genya defeated him. Kokushibo clearly had a more complicated relationship with Yorichi than one would at first assume based on Kokushibo's harsh retelling of his own backstory. It's revealed that after Yorichi passed on, Muzan and Kokushibo finished off anyone else who knew sun breathing and its forms. And yet, Yorichi's techniques remained because he passed them on through Sumiyoshi via the Dance of the Fire God. So that's Yorichi's life. He was so strong that he crushed Muzan in a second or two, made him run away like a big, frightened, and emotionally scarred for life baby, and even as an old man, he was light years ahead of Upper Moon 1, and only lost because he passed on due to old age. Nobody but old age could even harm him. And yet, that's not where Yorichi's legacy dies. He continues to haunt Muzan from beyond the grave, and his existence more than any other contributes to Muzan's eventual demise. We already looked at how Tanjiro would not be around today if Yorichi hadn't saved Sumiyoshi and his family from a demon. So you can say that Tanjiro being alive is thanks to Yorichi, and so is the fact that he learned sun breathing, obviously. If not for Yorichi, there would be no Tanjiro, and since Tanjiro was the first marked one of this generation, the others wouldn't awake Demon Slayer marks either, their swords wouldn't turn bright red, and so on. Tanjiro is the key to beating Muzan, and the others rally behind him to get it done. Unlike the golden age of Demon Slayers, where they ridiculously preferred to exile the best fighters. Demon Slayer shows the importance of teamwork, and how even though no one individually surpassed Yorichi, as a group that had help from Yorichi, they were able to surpass him together in the sense that they were able to finish off Muzan once and for all. One of the biggest reasons they were able to do this in the first place is because of Tamayo's poison that kept weakening Muzan and even prevented his body from dividing like it did before against Yorichi in order to escape. And guess what else? If not for Yorichi freeing her and inviting her to join the cause, then that circumstance never would have come about either. Then there's the fact that when Muzan gets weak enough during the final fight, the wounds Yorichi inflicted upon him start showing up on his body, despite the fact that the fight took place around 460 years ago. 
We're told Muzan never recovered and Yorichi burnt Muzan at a cellular level. These scars help the Demon Slayers of the present see Muzan's weak spots. As Tanjiro thinks to himself, even now, 400 years after his death, Yorichi is still showing them the way. It's interesting to see during this fight how Muzan remembers his encounter with Yorichi. He says at first Yorichi seemed weak and didn't show any drive, fighting spirit, hatred, or animosity. And as you'll recall from the Tanjiro vs. Akaza fight, that's because he's reached that ultimate selfless state that martial artists aspire to reach. Muzan reveals that Yorichi's wounds to him would continue to burn his flesh for hundreds of years like sunlight. So you can imagine Muzan just chilling, having some tea, and still feeling the pain of that centuries-old fight. It's not surprising then when Muzan says, not even God or Buddha would have expected Yorichi to be so strong and capable. Muzan compares it to a ridiculous myth. And my favorite part, he goes on to say the real monster was him and not me. Meaning Yorichi, the strongest demon slayer in history, is so monstrously strong, he makes the demon king look like a human. Praise just doesn't get much bigger than that. You know you're strong when the big bad boss of the series views you as the real monster. And yeah, even though Muzan repeatedly says that none of these guys are comparable to Yorichi, Yorichi laid the groundwork so they wouldn't have to be as strong as him individually to beat Muzan. They just had to let Tamayo's poison do its thing and work together using the breathing styles that Yorichi started to drag out the fight until the sun came up. And that is pretty much it for showing why Muzan is so afraid. Not only is Yorichi dangerous when he's fighting you one on one, he continues to haunt the demon king from the grave through countless ways, through the burning of his flesh, through the breath styles he brought into being, through Tanjiro his successor, through Tamayo and her poison, and in many other ways. In the end, you can say that Yorichi did defeat Muzan, he just needed a little help from his friends to finish him off once and for all. I hope you have a newfound appreciation for my favorite character if you tuned in to the end, or if you already loved him and recognized his awesomeness, I just hope you enjoyed reliving all of his legendary exploits. Yorichi is one of the best role models ever, and not because he was super strong, which he was, but because as Kokushibo mentioned, he had such a faultless character. Anyways, that is it for this one. If you did enjoy this video and want to keep them coming, channel the Yorichi within and slay that like button with no mercy. Always remember, smashing that like button is Yorichi energy and passing is scared Muzan energy, so choose wisely. If you haven't, make this the video you subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications or you will miss future Demon Slayer videos and updates. And while you wait for the next video to drop, feel free to check out my growing Demon Slayer playlist that includes videos on all the Hashira, Demon Moons, why everyone is afraid of Tanjiro, and much more. Link to that is in the description. Hashtag Yorichi is the best, and until next time, see ya Space Cowboys.